everybody. Um, I think we're past the starting time, so um, just a couple of quick notes since we're starting the afternoon session here. We have two talks. Um, they're about 45 minutes each. So first we have Matthew Garrett speaking on remote attestation. Um, I chatted with him and it's probably, if you have questions, give it five more minutes and otherwise they're probably better at the end, but um, he's gonna, probably gonna cover what you have to ask for anyway, so um, focus on that. Other than that, I don't think we have anything specific to say. I, I'm sure most of you have seen Matthew a, a couple of times at a conference before, maybe about 20 or, yeah, I know. Um, we have the guy up here who's sort of losing his marbles and you know, making funny questions, but I'll ignore him. Um, and after that, we have Feng Tang, I think, I'm sorry, I get names wrong, who will speak on fast boot, so stay around for that too. Other than that, let's go. Okay, uh, my name is Matthew Garrett. I work at Google on one of the internal platform security teams. So my job is not focused on the production servers, uh, not focused on any products, but instead I work on the security of the systems that are used by Google employees on a day-to-day -day basis, ranging from phones up to through workstations, laptops, and servers. Today, I'm going to be talking about TPM-based remote attestation and why this is useful both in corporate environments but also in potentially uh, personal environments. And we'll get into that a little later. But to begin with, it's helpful to have some idea of what we actually mean when I say attestation. And here is a not particularly helpful dictionary definition, but the point here is that when we talk about attestation, we're talking about something attesting to the state of something else. We're saying this thing says and has a justifiable reason for doing so, this it thing is true about something else. And attestation in general is a sort of difficult problem. In, for the most part, we don't trust people to attest to their own competence uh, because historically we found that people are not particularly trustworthy in that respect. If you ask someone, are you someone I should hire, then there's a decent chance that they'll say yes. And if you then trust them on that, you may find out that in fact they were not necessarily someone who you should have hired. And the same is true of computers. While computers are not in themselves capable of doing anything without being told to, for the most part, if someone tells a computer to lie to you, then the computer will lie to you. If a computer's running trustworthy code and you ask the computer, are you running trustworthy code, and the computer comes back and says yes, then sure, that's a good sign. However, if the computer is not running trustworthy code and you ask the computer, are you running trustworthy code, it's probably not going to say no. <laughs> so, you basically have a state diagram where the response is, yes, I'm running trustworthy code, which can either mean, yes, I am running trustworthy code, or no, I'm not running trustworthy code, but whoever wrote the malicious code was competent enough to convince me to lie to you about it. So telling the difference between these two things when all you have is a computer is basically impossible. We need something more than that. So, we need some sort of third party that can be relied upon to give us accurate information, even if the computer itself has been compromised. Now, when I, sorry, I should clarify. When I say on most platforms here, I'm specifically talking about PCs. There are alternative approaches that's been implemented in various other spaces. Uh, mobile phones, for instance, tend to have non-TPM-based solutions to this, although TPMs are becoming increasingly common in the phone space as well. So TPM is a trusted platform module. It's a small device that doesn't consume a lot of power, uh, but as a consequence is also not particularly powerful. It sits there, it can't do a lot. There's some degree of uh, support for cryptographic primitives on the TPM. TPMs can generate cryptographic keys, they can encrypt some information, 
they can sign some information. Um, they can generate random numbers. But other than that, they can't do a whole lot. They've got a small amount of local storage, but really, again, not a lot of local storage. And fundamentally, the most fundamentally important thing, and something that was frequently misunderstood about TPMs in the past, is that TPMs have no ability to directly inspect the state of the system. TPMs on most PC platforms are attached to the LPC, uh, the low pin count bus, which is a derivative of the old PC ISA bus. There's no way they can DNA stuff arbitrarily out of memory. There's no way they can see what the CPU is doing. There's just physically no connection between the TPM and where most of the system state is kept. So that makes it sound like a TPM is not particularly useful. Uh, like if a TPM is incapable of inspecting the state of the system, how does the TPM find out about the state of the system? And the answer is that, well, if you want to know about the state of the operating system, then the operating system tells the TPM. And this is arguably uh, getting back to the problem we had before of how do we trust the operating system to tell the TPM the truth. And obviously, we can't, because we can't trust the operating system to give us that information. In order to determine whether we can trust the operating system, we need to know whether we can trust the previous components. And so the way this works on TPMs is that the bootloader tells the TPM about the operating system. If the operating system has been tampered with, then when the bootloader tells the TPM about the operating system, it will tell it that this operating system is different to the operating system you expected. Obviously, an attacker could tamper with the bootloader, so the firmware tells the TPM about the bootloader. And then again, if the bootloader is modified, then the TPM will be given different information. These days, the firmware is basically a small operating system itself. So the very early stages of the firmware tell the TPM about the rest of the firmware. On Intel systems, if you have the boot guard feature enabled, then the uh, management engine, which is an entirely separate x86 device that is embedded in the platform chipset, will verify the firmware and tell the TPM about the firmware boot block. So if you can trust the management engine, you can trust everything. <laughs> As I said, the TPMs are not particularly competent or complicated. They can't obtain significant contextual information or store significant contextual information about what they're being given. So what can we actually pass to the TPM? And the answer is a series of cryptographic hashes. Rather than tell the TPM anything complicated about the operating system or the bootloader, we generate a cryptographic hash of that component and pass that to the TPM. Now, the TPM doesn't store that value directly, because otherwise, you could just get to the point where you have a malicious operating system, and then you just overwrite the TPM's stored values. Instead, the TPM has a series of what are called platform configuration registers, or PCRs. And when you provide a hash to the TPM, you say, please use this hash to extend this PCR. And the TPM then takes the current value of the PCR, takes the value you passed it, concatenates those, and then takes a cryptographic hash of that. And then that's what's stored in the PCR. Now that means that the value of the PCR depends on the value of every hash that was given to it. But critically, it also depends on the order that it was given those hashes. If you pass it a hash that is all zeros and then a hash that is all ones, you'll get a different final answer to if you pass it a hash that's all ones and then a hash that's all zeros. So you have something that is predictable as long as the inputs are predictable, but otherwise impossible to spoof as long as the cryptographic hash algorithm in question is not broken. <laughs> 
Now, there are multiple PCRs, and different PCRs are used to measure different boot components. PCR0 is used to measure the system firmware. PCR2 is used to measure uh, option ROM drivers and associated files. And PCR7, for instance, is used on x86 systems to measure the secure boot configuration and state. So the TPM now has a bunch of these hashes, and the TPM will give those hashes back to anybody that asks for them. But you want to know that those hashes actually came from the TPM. So the TPM is able to generate a signature that covers the PCR values and a nonce. So the nonce is provided in order to prevent someone recording a TPM transaction where the values are good and then replacing the operating system with something malicious and just giving you the same response. Every time you want the TPM to a test, you give it a new random value and the signature that comes back covers the hashes and that random value which prevents this replay attack. Once you get this blob back, so you've got the PCR values and you've got a signature that covers those values, you can verify that the signature matches and then you can see whether the PCRs match the expected values. And if they do, then the system booted in the expected state. In a moment, I'm going to come back to how you know that you can trust the signing key. But if the operating system is the thing that's asking the TPM for this information, and if the operating system is something that makes a policy decision based on this, a malicious operating system can just ignore the fact that the values were not the ones that were expected and can do whatever it wants to do anyway. So in order to handle this attestation in a meaningful way, we need a trusted third party at the other end. And this is where remote attestation comes in. In remote attestation, rather than the operating system attempting to validate the PCRs itself, a remote machine takes the signed values and the signature and then looks at those values and makes some sort of policy decision based on whether it believes that those values are legitimate and good or not. Problem here is, firstly, well, okay, how do I know that these values are actually coming from a TPM at all? You know, these are all very standard cryptographic operations. It's very easy to write a piece, of soft, a piece of software that behaves the same way as a real TPM. In fact, there are multiple software implementations of TPMs that are used for validation and testing. But each TPM has what's called an endorsement key. Now, the endorsement key can either be generated by the TPM at the runtime, but more commonly, the endorsement key is generated at the factory while the TPM is being produced. The TPM manufacturer then generates and provides a certificate that corresponds to that endorsement key and which chains back to the TPM manufacturer. So when initially determining whether the information you're uh, looking at is coming from a real TPM, you make sure that the TPM has a valid endorsement certificate and that, that certificate chains back to the TPM manufacturer. And then you verify that the attestation key, the key that's used to sign the PCR values, corresponds to the endorsement key. And there's a kind of slightly awkward set of hoops that you jump through to make this happen, uh, unless you're actually implementing this yourself, which I recommend you don't do for reasons I'll get onto later, you don't need to care. Just magic happens here and it's good. <laughs> so we can then say, okay, this, the signature that covers these PCRs was made with an attestation key that corresponds to an endorsement key that came from a real TPM as opposed to a software TPM. And great, we have the ability for the remote site to verify that this set of PCRs came from a real TPM. The problem is interpreting these values is difficult. If 
all we have is the set of final PCR values. That doesn't tell us a lot. So sure, we can say, okay, these values today are not the same as these values from yesterday. But does that mean that the system was compromised or does that mean that the system was upgraded? These two are in the sort of situation where upgrading the system causes it to now misbehave, as I'm sure we've all experienced. The difference may not be that semantically useful, but you know, it's still relevant that we have some way of knowing what the cause for the changed values is. And thankfully, we have one. The TPM event log is uh, something that contains additional data, but also contains every event. So the TPM itself only has access to the final hash value. The event log contains a record of how we got to that state. The TPM has no awareness of the event log. The event log is stored in system memory and it contains a bunch of metadata that corresponds to the hash value, but which is not itself past the TPM. The TPM only gets the hash. The TPM can't see the log. So stuff that we put in the event log would include, for instance, uh, when we measure a bootloader, we only pass the hash of the bootloader to uh, the TPM. But the event log would contain information like which file on the file system was booted in order to generate this hash. Uh, so there's a lot of useful additional information there. You had a question? Uh, yeah. I have a question here. Uh, you say that TPM does not have, have any access to uh, the TPM event log. So the question is, uh, what part of the system generates the event log? Yeah. So the event log is generated by, in the boot environment, the firmware. Uh, when, you, when a boot component wants to pass a measurement to the TPM, it calls a firmware command. On BIOS systems, there's a software interrupt to do this. On UEFI, there's a TPM protocol that you open, and then there's a command. There's a function pointer hanging off that that you call. Um, the firmware then does the communication with the TPM, but it also appends the additional metadata that you give it to the event log. At the point where you're handing off to the runtime operating system, the operating system takes responsibility for maintaining the event log from that point onwards. So on Linux, on UEFI systems, we copy the event log from the firmware up to the running operating system. And we don't actually continue appending to it. Instead, we just generate a, event log, a new event log in a separate location that's exposed elsewhere in SysFS. But you can merge these things together in order to get an overall uh, contiguous event log. Now, the bit earlier where I said, okay, if you can't trust the operating, you can't necessarily trust the operating system. So if the event log is under firmware control and under operating system control, and we don't necessarily trust either the firmware or the operating system, how do we trust the event log? And the answer there is actually fairly straightforward. We know how the TPM generates its values. So we can just replay the values in the event log in the same way. And if the event log is legitimate, we should get the same values that the TPM has. It turns out this isn't always true, but um, <laughs> I'll get to that later. So we replay the hashes and they get to the same end result. Great, so we now know that those hashes in the event log correspond to what was actually measured. Either that or someone has broken whichever cryptographic hash we're using, in which case we're all going to have a bad day. Yeah, yeah, well, different levels of broken. Uh, so the next thing is to look at the individual events. And depending on the event type, it's potentially possible to verify that the additional metadata that was provided in the event log itself hashes to 
the value that was put into the TPM. If so, so an example of this would be, say, the kernel command line. If the kernel command line is put into the event log, then we can replay the event log. We can look at the hash that corresponded to the kernel event log, make sure that that's part of a series of things that corresponds to the final value in the TPM, and if so, we can then check whether the kernel command line in the event log hashes to the value that was measured. And if so, we know that the event log contains a legitimate, untampered with copy of the kernel command line. And then the remote system can look at that and make a policy decision, like if it sees Intel IO MMU equals off, it can potentially determine that your system is vulnerable to DMA-based attacks and therefore your system shouldn't be considered trustworthy and refuse to grant you access to a resource. So the event log largely contains information that is defined by a combination of the trusted computing group PC client uh, specification, the TCG EFI specification, and the Microsoft Secure Boot PCR7 specification that is confusingly buried at the end of a web page about something related but mostly different. <laughs> it's also, con so we get a bunch of information about the firmware. Um, we get the hashes of any EFI drivers that were loaded and any EFI applications that were loaded, such as your bootloader. We get information about the secure boot configuration that's merged into PCR7. So PCR7 ends up telling you was secure boot enabled? Um, if secure boot enabled, what was the set of trusted signing keys? And also, which signing key was used to verify whatever actually booted the system? There's actually potentially a lot more. Operating systems are free to put whatever they want into the event log. And Windows actually stuffs a huge amount of additional information into the event log, including information about whether uh, the system was booted with the test signing keys enabled, whether the system was using the TPM to provide the disk decryption key, and also the hashes and signing information of a lot of early boot components. So by looking at the event log, you can verify whether Windows launched uh, Windows Defender in the early boot process before any other user land applications were started. Right now on the Linux side, we're not doing as much of that. So the event log also contains a lot of information about the system firmware. Uh, the spec gives some guidance on what some of this information should look like. Uh, the spec is not well followed in this respect. Different vendors put very different information in the same events. And in some cases, we have no idea what that information actually is. But PCR zero, while it is expected to contain information about the firmware, contains generally multiple different measurements. And in the case where you're using BootGuard, the first measurement in there would be BootGuard validating the early uh, firmware block. If you're using Intel TXT, which is uh, a TPM-based technology, then you may also have a measurement of code that's contained within the system chipset. And then this can get very confusing because when you upgrade the firmware, the code that's within the chipset doesn't also get updated. So if different revisions of the chipset have different versions of that firmware, you can have different systems that, even though they're running the same firmware version, end up with different final values in PCR zero. Now, some vendors have realized that, well, okay, if the point of this is to verify the firmware, it would be good for people to know what the legitimate values are. And some vendors put this information in uh, readme files that accompany their firmware update, which is not the most straightforward way to obtain machine passable information. Uh, but also the Linux vendor firmware service has information, uh, has a field where you can provide this information. However, as I said, PCR0 itself actually contains multiple events. And ideally, 
we want to be able to look at individual events rather than just the final event, both because it's uh, informative. For instance, one of the events is supposed to be the firmware version, so having a cryptographically verifiable way of saying, okay, this platform is running this version of the firmware is useful. Uh, you can end up in situations where, depending on chipset revision, the PCR0 value may be different. And if you're able to see all the individual values, then you can figure that out and handle it appropriately. So knowing the valid values is useful, as is knowing how to parse information from them. HP workstations in the BIOS version field, uh, in the events that is supposed to contain the firmware version, provides like 180 bytes or so of information, which includes the firmware version, something that looks like a date stamp, and then a lot of stuff that is very mysterious. No idea whether we can pull any information out of that or uh, if we should attempt to. So that's been so far mostly about validating the device state. But device state, while interesting, is not the only thing you care about. You also care about device identity. Two laptops running exactly the same firmware, running the same operating system, but one belongs to me and one belongs to a state-sponsored attacker. If they're both trying to access the same resource, it's helpful for me to be able to tell which of them is the legitimate machine and which of them is the malicious machine. So every machine has a unique endorsement key in the TPM, but that doesn't tell you anything about the machine. That tells you something about the TPM. The Trusted Computing Group have a spec for something called a platform certificate, and platform certificates bind the endorsement key to the system. So you have uh, a certificate that contains information about the endorsement key, but also contains, for instance, the machine serial number. So if you have the platform certificate, and if you have the endorsement key, and we previously talked about how you get and verify trust in the endorsement key, you can then verify that this machine is the machine with this serial number. And then if you have a decent relationship with your system vendor, when you purchase the system, they can tell you in advance what serial number is going to be shipped to you, and then you can pre-trust systems as long as they provide a platform certificate that has a serial number that corresponds to the presented endorsement key. Right now, there's not particularly good ecosystem support for this. There are, uh, Intel have some amount of tooling to provide this information, but it's not really as yet picked up by the majority of PC vendors. The other problem is that the platform certificate is not an X509 PKI certificate of the sort that you're sort of generally used to. It's something called an attribute certificate, and almost no tooling supports this at all. The only widespread crypto library that is able to support this is Bouncy Castle, which then ties you into the Java ecosystem. OpenSSL cannot parse these things. Once you've got strong device identity, you can do stuff like uh, trust a system based on, okay, we can cryptographically verify that this machine has this serial number. And as long as the vendor isn't shipping multiple systems with the same serial number, we know that any machine that's able to cryptographically verify, uh, prove that it has this serial number is the machine that we ordered that had that serial number. So right now, you buy a new server, and you want to put some secret material on it. How do you do that? How do you bootstrap that? So you can send it to a data center, and then someone that you trust can rack it, log on, prove their identity, and then install the secret information. You can get it shipped to your office, and you can put the secret material on there and then ship it to the data center. But in that case, anyone who intercepts it is going to be able to obtain that secret information. If you're able to trust device identity well, then you can just have the manufacturer ship that system straight to the data center. You can have an arbitrary untrusted person rack it, and then the machine can net boot. 
perform remote attestation. You can verify the machine's identity. You can verify that it booted the operating system you expected with the firmware you expected. And then you can, well, okay, this is a trustworthy machine in a trustworthy state. I can provision it with secret information. And you don't need anybody locally with the machine to generate that trust. Do you want the microphone? You've got a missing step in your trust because you can't trust the endorsement key certificate to attest to the serial number because I could go out and buy a TPM of the same manufacturer and use that fake serial number and entire log. But so the platform certificate's not issued by the... Right. So you have to do this really complicated... Yeah, so the, the generating the trust in the endorsement key is not just looking at the endorsement certificates. That only gets you back to the TPM vendor. So you need instead to look at the combination of the endorsement key and the platform certificate in order to verify the uh, device identity as opposed to the TPM identity. So this also opens up some other fun possibilities. For instance, uh, if a machine is able to, if you can generate proof that a machine is the machine you expect it to be, you can then issue the machine with another certificate that allows you to bind a machine's TPM identity to its internet identity. So you can issue a certificate that includes the machine host name and tie the host name to the endorsement key. And then you can trust that machine to generate proof of its own identity for arbitrary services. And so an example here is that you could generate the SSH host key on the TPM and then have the machine have a certificate that allows it to demonstrate, right, this SSH host key chains back to a TPM that is associated with this host name. And then trust on first use in SSH goes away. This is somewhat annoying to actually implement because the SSH protocol doesn't let you do this in terms of its uh, certificate validation. So we need to extend SSH little to do this, but it's that's just mostly typing. In the Linux world, uh, so over the past few years, we've gone from a situation where basically the firmware was the only thing generating TPM measurements and events to the majority of the boot chain doing so. I mentioned PCR7 and the secure boot stuff. Uh, so one of the problems with that was that when you use shim to bridge between the Microsoft secure boot root of trust and the individual distribution root of trust, that information vanished. And so it was not possible to verify whether the system was booting with the distribution certificate or booting with a certificate that the end user had installed. So Shim now measures the certificates that it actually ends up using into PCR7 as well. So the final PCR7 values now give you information about the entire certificate chain, not just the initial component thereof. Uh, latest grub code will also measure the kernel, the MFS, the kernel command line, and if you want, every single command that grub executes. So you can get a lot of information about uh, the boot process. The event log is exported via this very easy to remember path. TPM2 devices that are using the TCG2 crypto agile log format, that will only appear on 5.3 or later. So, uh, because, right. Once the kernel has booted, then, uh, we basically hand off to the Integrity Measurement Architecture, or IMA, which is then responsible for, based on a policy that was given to it, measuring any applications or sensitive files that are accessed at runtime. So right now, we're still sort of lacking PCR zero values from vendors, but the other thing we're missing is that distributions are not giving us the expected PCR values for things like their bootloaders or their kernels. And are you? Do you publish that now? <laughs> 
Soon? Great. Fedora will do that soon, apparently. So I've been talking about this in the sense of, well, this sounds like something where you need a big corporate level amount of infrastructure, but that's not strictly true. Remote attestation doesn't need to be particularly remote. All you need is a communications channel to a trusted device and some way to indicate success or failure. So you could imagine a small device that you plug into a USB port that during boot you tap it and then it through some software agent running on the operating system, ends up verifying the TPM state and then tells you by a blinking LED whether the state is expected or not. So we can go that simple. But we could also imagine using Bluetooth to communicate between the phone and a laptop and then the phone being able to connect to the vendor's site, to the distribution site, and then pull down the expected values and check whether what you've booted matches the expected values and tell you whether your system is running in an expected state or not. In terms of implementations, um, HERS, H-I-R-S, is the most complete implementation, but it's also uh, written by the US government and is therefore immensely complicated and large and unwieldy. Keylime has a very nice website um, but is also the thing that's probably the easiest to deploy at the moment. In terms of implementation, it's a set of Python that wraps various C binaries, so it's, it's not a particularly elegant implementation. Uh, it does, however, work and exist now. The team I'm on has been working on a complete implementation of all of this in Go. Uh, we're running this internally. We now have something like 30,000 machines performing remote attestation on a daily basis, uh, which is using this code. Now, this does not include the client and server we're using because they're very heavily tied into our infrastructure and just don't work elsewhere. But there is a sample client and a sample server implemented as part of that. Do they implement the same wire protocol as Keyline? No. Right. Uh, they, they could do. Um, this is largely just the implementations. You, if you want to wrap the information you get into a specific wire protocol, yeah, go for it. Anyway, so. Uh, Go Attestation implements the uh, both ends. Uh, it has the code for performing key certification, um, generating a quote, and generating the attestation keys, and then the server side for validating all of that stuff. Right now, it will tell you whether your event log is valid, but it won't give you the metadata from the individual events. Uh, that code's written, but we're trying to figure out the right API to expose. Uh, so it'll be landing shortly. In terms of stuff to do, making this all work really well involves platform certificates being basically ubiquitous, and we're a long way from being there yet. System vendors, we want to get PCL zero values. Uh, device vendors, it would be really nice to know whether a specific driver hash value corresponds to something that was actually issued by a specific GPU manufacturer, for instance. Uh, OS vendors, we'd love to have all the boot components. It sounds like Fedora is going to be doing that soon. General agreement on what material should be measured and when, how much additional metadata should we be generating during the boot process, and is there any more that we need to be? And then ideally also uh, validation, infrastructure for validating that firmware actually behaves the correct way. There have been cases where you can reboot firmware and it'll do something like accidentally measure the time of day, which then means that the measurement will vary every time. So that's bad. We would like it to be possible to know that that's not going to happen. So I think we've got about two minutes for questions before I have to get out of the way for the next speaker. So you say um, measuring the time would be bad and agreement on what should be measured. As long as it's measured in a way that it is its own independent measurement that you can read in the log, at, one lo at some level that doesn't really matter, right? Yeah, there's no problem with measuring something as long as it's put in a defined place in a defined structure with defined semantics. Uh, 
the time's not actually particularly useful because sure. the clock can just lie to you. I agree that's it's not useful. That's, that's, kind of that's kind of bad data dependency, though, because that, your, your statement's true, but only true if you can actually do it for everything in the law. Um, There's also a facility where we seal certain data to PCR values. We can't have them changing every boot and do that sealing. Sure, that's true. But from an attestation perspective, you don't care right. about Right, from an attestation, from if, you're going to, if you're going to measure dynamic data, that should probably go into a different PCR For from sure. all yeah. the static data. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I remain a little skeptical about all of this for one simple reason, that it, rel it relies on all the, signing for all, all the signing machinery to be more or less bug-free, and we know how common bug-free software is. And secondly, it relies on the, TP on the TPM's various key, pri private, private sides, its various keys not leaking. And SGX had machinery to do remote attestation, and it's leaked twice because of side channel attacks. What's the stop yeah, something um, happening here? So Side channel attacks work if you've got a high bandwidth side channel, which is why SGX was attacked. The TPM sits on a very low bandwidth bus. This isn't a deliberate defense mechanism, it's just a cost thing. But that makes it very difficult to get side channels into. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult to get side channels in. Uh, so you're thinking right. of management engine TPMs that run in firmware instead of a, a physical TPM is difficult to get out through side channels. It's not necessarily impossible. Um, no. So, but on the other hand, there's no key material that's shared across multiple TPMs. Attacking a single TPM only gets you the key material for that specific TPM. So, and if you're going to want to fake the results of a given machine, you're going to need access to that machine with enough time to extract key material from it, and then after that, you can duplicate that machine, but only that machine. So, it's it would have to be a very targeted attack. Yeah. I think last question. I uh, just wanted to say uh, thanks for the fixing my laptop way back when. But um, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> on, on, on a more related note, um, uh, <laughs> on a more related note, um, how far um, uh, do we need to go in providing material? Does it have to be the, like, the case that? Um, if you've got hardware in your machine, that also needs to be somehow logging like firmware versions into this, these logs Yeah, as well, that's or? a great question. Um, so what we see at the moment is that in terms of the boot environment, any option ROMs that run plug-in cards will be measured into PCR2, and that will generally include any um, additional uh, like metadata and firmware. Once we're later into the boot process, that's then up to the operating system to set and define a policy. So we could either do that by measurement or we can basically do that by just asserting that, well, the operating system or the hardware will not load anything that isn't appropriately signed. Uh, one more question, back to the TPM event lock. So as I understand, uh, as I understand correctly, if you talk directly uh, via LPC to the TPM, mm -hmm. then the TPM event lock is not created, right? Uh, the firmware, need you need to, if you're going to extend the event lock, then you need to be using functionality that knows how to extend the event lock. Yeah. So if you drive the firmware directly behind the, if you drive the TPM directly behind the firmware's back, then unless you yourself extend the event log, then the event log won't be extended. It's basically the thing that is directly talking to the TPM has to take responsibility for managing the event log. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.